move 42. Set, hut, hut. Everything was made for a specific purpose. That's not what that was made for. That's not what that was made for. That's not what that was made for. Growth Track, discover your purpose. Well, hey everybody, it's great to have you this weekend, and uh, do you know why you were created? Do you understand your purpose? Well, that's what we're about this morning, and as we continue our series entitled Grow Up, because, um, you know, I realize that it's possible for us to grow older, but not to grow up. When I was a boy, um, my parents would uh, take me and my brother to visit Aunt Edna, and as I grew older, I discovered that what happened is that with Aunt Edna, she grew older but she never grew up mentally and emotionally. She had the mindset of about a five-year-old. So although she had grown older, she never grew up. And I was using that analogy because I know, uh, as having been a pastor in a ministry for more than 40 years now, that I've discovered any number of people within the church that have grown older in Jesus, but have never really grown up in Jesus. Do you understand what I'm saying? And that really is God's desire for us, is to move beyond immaturity. Hebrews tells us, therefore, let us move beyond the elementary things uh, in Christ and to move towards maturity. Also, Peter said it very succinctly in 2 Peter chapter 3. He said, but let us grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that I want you to know that as a church, we're incredibly intentional about helping you grow. And one of the uh, new and incredible tools that God has given to us, is, and you've been hearing a lot about it, is Growth Track. And it's an it's a incredible tool that God can use to help all of us grow in a relationship with Jesus and help understand whether you're a brand new believer or you've been a believer a long time, helping you understand God's desire and his purpose for your life. And the four steps that you'll discover in Growth Track are knowing God, also then finding com community and opportunity to get together with other believers, discovering your purpose, and then making a difference. And so this morning, my assignment is to talk us about that third step, discovering purpose. And uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I've discovered in my life that sometimes very profound things happen in the most simplest of ways. And when I think about purpose, I'm thinking of that great theologian, Alice in Wonderland, who said this, if you don't know where you're headed, any road will get you there. Profound, right? Well, the sad truth is that millions of Americans today have no idea why God created them, that they are living totally without purpose, and that they fill their schedules and their daytimers with all kinds of frenzied activity, but at the end of the day, they really don't understand their purpose. But you know, it's not anything that's even new with us. I was interested to note, as I did research on the subject, that Isaiah the prophet at one point said this, I've labored to no purpose and I've spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Well, my guess is in a crowd this size, there are any number of you that can identify with that verse is that I've labored to no purpose. Well, the good news is that at the end of his life, he certainly had discovered his purpose and this is what he said, God grants perfect peace to those who keep their purpose firm that God gives peace to those who keep their purpose firm. And so you understand that peace and purpose go together. And if you don't have purpose in life, that you will continually be frustrated and that God's word could not be any clearer about his desire for us. And listen to this. It says that God made everything for his own purposes. God made everything for his own purposes. And so God's purpose becomes clear for me and for you when you understand how he has uniquely created you. And uh, step three, that's what it's really all about, helping you discover your redemptive purpose so that you can live a life that God created you to live that will give you great joy and meaning, purpose, as well as peace. And that proceeds also as a part of this is discovering your gifts and giftings.
Now, have you been wondering what in the world this is all about with gifts on the platform? Well, I confess that Christmas, just about two months away from us now, is absolutely my favorite time of year. Can anybody say an amen to that? I love Christmas. I love all the sights and sounds and smells, and I love the carols and the cookies. And uh, also, I love the gifts. And I am a firm believer that the only difference between men and boys is the price of their toys. Uh, you know, and as I was growing up, my parents, we, we didn't, I didn't grow up in a, an affluent home, but my parents were always sensitive and, hey, what do you guys want for Christmas, you know? And uh, so I most I always got pretty much what I wanted for Christmas, but there was one thing that somehow my parents missed, and that is, anybody recognize this? Rock'em Sock'em Robots. And uh, so I may not have gotten them as a kid, but I said I can buy them as an adult. And, you know, I have grandkids. That's always a great excuse. Grandkids are an excuse for lots of things. And uh, so Melanie and I have Friday night at the fights. Rock'em Sock'em. No, that's not true at all. Um, but at any rate, I did bring these. But, you know, there was one other thing that when I was in high school, I wanted a leather coat. Actually, I wore this coat today for, actually, for, for this reason is that I wanted a leather coat. And so I told my parents, hey, you know, this is the kind of thing I want for Christmas. And when I speak of leather coats, friends, this is the kind of thing I had in mind, kind of almost a sport coat, leather coat. And so on Christmas morning, run up there, it's Christmas, we're open presents, and I was so excited to get my leather coat. And I knew that my parents were anxious and excited about this too. And so I tore into the box and opened it up, and there's my white, crop sheepskin coat and my parents were like <laughs> and I was like <laughs> but I you know and mom and dad if you're in heaven you know you're watching from heaven I know you are please ex excuse me but that was like the worst I mean just totally the worst and I love my parents and I wouldn't have heard them for the world but I was like stunned you know, when you're thinking of this and you get a crop white, yellow, or white coat, it's just like, wow, that is so great. <laughs> and so anyway, I tried to, but you know, I, I wore it probably two or three times in, you know, 10 years after I got it for Christmas, I gave it to a friend. But anyway, aren't you glad that God is the perfect parent and he never misses he always knows what's best for us and that he gifts us. He gifts each one of us according to his purpose and his desires because he knows what's best for each one of us and that we can trust him. So let me put it this way. There's no one else in the whole human race with your kind of style and your kind of grace. God has uniquely gifted you. And that I want you to know that our desire as a ministry team is to help everyone that calls Calvary Temple their church home to discover as well as to develop and use their gift for kingdom purposes. And included in that growth track are four or five different assessments that will literally help you pinpoint how God has uniquely gifted and created you and that you can use those for kingdom purposes that will great, give you great joy. And speaking of that, I want to kind of push pause. And, and really, if, if you don't hear hardly anything else I say, I want you to hear this because I mean it with every ounce of my fiber and of my being. The greatest fulfillment you will experience in life outside your relationship with, with uh, family and friends is when you understand what your purpose is and how God has gifted you and you're using those for kingdom purposes. For example, God has given me the gift of teaching and I'm finding great joy in what I do because this is how God has gifted me. Maybe you remember Eric Liddell that uh, in the Chariots of Fire, he said, when I run, I feel God's pleasure. And so that when you understand your, your purpose and how God has created you, there's great joy and great fulfillment that comes along with that. And I hope that you've experienced that. Well, this morning I want to take a, a look. I just want to walk through a very important passage of Scripture where the Apostle Paul talked about the discovery process and how God has uniquely made us. And it's 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's a wonderful, powerful passage and very practical passage of Scripture. So if you have your mobile device or your Bible with you in hand, I want us to read the first few verses and then we'll skip down to verse 11. So this is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And Paul said, now about spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagan, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit says... 
Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. And there are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now, to each one, would you say those two words together? Now to each one, for the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. And then go to verse 11. All of these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. So it's really up to God. So I want to walk through this passage of Scripture and that I want you to notice three things about how God, three keys to the discovery process. And the first is, is really a challenge, and that is to be informed about spiritual gifts. Be informed. So Paul clearly said, now about spiritual gifts, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now, I have a question for you this morning. How many of you have ever heard this? Ignorance is what? Bliss. bliss. Well, do you believe that? Well, certainly ignorance about some things certainly could be bliss. For example, what you don't know about ice makers or what you don't know about chain link fences, that's not going to hurt you. But there are some things in this life that could be devastating if, here again, you go along in life saying that ignorance is bliss. There are some things that you definitely need to know. And one of them is about this whole area of spiritual giftings. And um, do you know that it can be, if you're ignorant in this area, that it can be devastating to us as a church body? I want you to listen to these words from Peter Wagner, who is a great, uh, uh, who is a professor at Fuller Seminary and also a, a student of the church. And he wrote a powerful book called Your Spiritual Gifts Can Help Your Church Grow. And in that book, this is what he said. I am convinced that ignorance of spiritual gifts may, the, may be the chief cause of retarded church growth today. It also may be the root of much of the discouragement, insecurity, frustration, and guilt that plagues many Christians and curtails their effectiveness for God. Man, that, that's kind of powerful, isn't it, when you think about the challenge of that? And that churches may be operating way below their potential because of ignorance in this area. And one of the other things that, uh, uh, as I was doing research for this message, that was really, to me, it was tragic. That George Barna, that I, I quote a lot, who does kind of studies of, of churches and believers in America, suggests that in recent years, the number of believers who think somehow maybe they were behind the door when God was passing out the gifts, they don't believe that God has gifted them, has gone up 500%. So in the church today, there's, I think a lot of people said that somehow God left me out. Well, that could not be further from the truth, but when we believe that, the consequences are tragic for every church's effectiveness. Well, Paul then follows that up, I think, with some very important explanations about the importance of not being ignorant. And the first is this, is that giftings originate with God's spirit. Um, please hear me this weekend. This is probably the most important thing that God wants you to know, having come here today. And it is this. Everyone, who's that include? Everyone. Everyone who has committed their life to Jesus is given gifts by the Spirit. That God doesn't leave anyone out. And uh, I've talked to, again, some Christ followers who say, Pastor Steve, I just feel like God somehow left me out. I said, that's, not, that, that's really not true. Read verse 11. It says he distributes to each one, and that includes everyone. So if, if you name the name of Jesus, when you say yes to him, the Holy Spirit begins to take up residence in your life and that he gives you gifts for kingdom purposes. Romans 12, it says we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us, not just to specific ones, just to the gifted, to the, the real spiritual marines. But here is as simply as I can say it. If you know Jesus, you have been gifted. Well, another reason we're challenged to be informed about things of the Spirit is that it will keep you from spiritual error. I thought that was rather interesting on the heels of all of this that Paul clearly talked about how that people have been led astray, here again, to false idols. How tragic it is, but true today. About half the world of which we are a part are caught up into false religions and spiritual isms that will lead to their eternal destruction. And so this is not something to mess with, that we need to understand when God's spirit comes, he will lead us into truth and away from error. But the spirit does not draw attention to himself, here again. But that leads us to the next thing, 
that the Spirit will always lead us to Jesus. It says no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit. And so that the, the purpose of God's Holy Spirit is always, first, last, and always, to point us to Jesus, not to himself. Think about the book of Acts. After the Holy Spirit came upon them in the upper room, what did it say they did? They went everywhere preaching the good news of Jesus, not talking about the fact that they'd been filled with the Spirit. They went everywhere talking about Jesus. And so the Spirit of God will lead us, always putting the spotlight on the Savior and not on himself. And so here's the challenge. Do not be ignorant, but be informed about spiritual gifts. And growth track is one of the great tools that will help you with that. Well, the next key that we see to the discovery process is this, is that we're called to celebrate diversity within the church body. We are called to celebrate diversity. Now, when I talk about diversity here, I'm not talking about ethnic diversity. And I want you to know that's one of the things that I absolutely love about our church is that we are, on a Sunday morning or on a weekend, we are the United Nations. A couple of uh, years ago, we did a, a, a series, a message based upon John 3.16, you know, for God so loved the world, and that we had people from our congregation come onto the platform and give that verse in their, their native language. And do you know we had 23 people groups represented? It took about 10 minutes for them. And it was exciting because I want you to know, friends, that's exactly what heaven's going to look like. The scripture says that when we get there, there will be people from every tribe and nation and tongue in the entire world. And so our church is simply a reflection of what heaven is going to be like. Aren't you excited about that? That gets me really excited and that I'm so thankful for our diversity. But that's not the kind of diversity that I'm talking about here. Paul here was talking about spiritual diversity. And if you do even a cursory study uh, in the New Testament, you'll discover that there are about 26 or 27 different gifts that are mentioned in the Bible. There are some of the bigger groupings that we pay, perhaps are a little bit more familiar with. For example, in Romans chapter 12, there are seven gifts that are mentioned there, and those are called motivational gifts. And that's kind of your window on the world. As I mentioned earlier, that uh, my, part of my primary motivational gift is teaching. And so I go around the world when I see things happening. I put things in perspective, three points in a poem. I could tell you and teach you about almost anything in the world because that's how I view the world. My wife, Melody, bless her heart, you can, she's every weekend is, is back at the guest chaos. That's my wonderful wife, Melody, of more than 44 years now. And her perspective on the world, she is an administrator. And I kid you not, she is an incredible administrator. And we will go to places like the airport. And, or this past summer, we were at a convention where there were like 10,000 delegates. And we were in this huge delegate hall. We were waiting in line. And I could just see my wife. And you know what she was doing? She was organizing the convention. And, and if they would have put her in charge, I'm sure it would have been a lot more efficient because she'd say, well, you know, they've got this long line here. They need to move that over there. And, if they do. and that's how she sees the world. But motivational gifts, every one of you have one primary motivational gift. Well, then in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, and Paul begins to list some of those here, are what we call manifestation gifts. That's the work of the Spirit in the body of Christ, to edify, to build up, and to encourage. But then also we have ministry gifts in Ephesians chapter 4, and there are five of those. God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints to do the work of ministry. And so when you add all of those up, there's about a little more than 20 of those gifts, and some of the ones that perhaps we're a little bit more familiar with, but there are others beside those gifts. And as a body, I want you to know that we want to celebrate your uniqueness and your importance in the church. Uh, this is something that I read some years ago that I, I just love, and I want to read it to you today. It's called A Rabbit on the Swim Team, and it really expresses where we're coming from as a church and as a leadership team. Once upon a time, the animals decided that they should do something meaningful about the problem of the new world. So they organized the school. They adopted an activity curriculum of running, climbing, swimming, and flying. And to make it easier to administrate the curriculum, all the animals took all the subjects. The duck was excellent in swimming, in fact, better than his instructor, but he only made passing grades in flying and was very poor in running. And since he was slow in running, he had to stop swimming and stay after school to practice running. This caused his web feet to be badly worn. So he was only average in swimming, but average was quite acceptable, so nobody worried about that, except the duck. <laughs> the rabbit started at the top of his class in running, but he developed a nervous twitch in his leg muscles because he was taking so much time to work and make up time in swimming. The squirrel was excellent in climbing, but he encountered constant frustration in flying class because his teacher made him start from the ground up instead of from the top treetop down. 
He developed a Charlie horse over overexerting and so only got a C in climbing and a D in running. Well, then the eagle was the problem child and was severely disciplined for being a nonconformist. In climbing classes, he beat all the others to the top of the tree, but insisted on using his own way to get there. <laughs> well, the reason I read that, and I want to tell you, and I, I say this sincerely, and here it is. If you're a duck, be a duck. That we want you, however, to be the best duck that you can possibly be, and that we're not going to try to pound round pegs into square holes, because we want to know how God's uniquely gifted you, and that when you understand that, and when you're using those gifts, there's great joy, and also efficiency and fulfillment within the body of Christ. And so we celebrate that. Well, then Paul gives us some clarification. He said there are different kinds of gifts. The word in the Greek New Testament there is the word charisms. It's where we get the word grace. Or, and my assistant's named Charis. Her, her name means Greek, uh, grace. But my point is that today in modern uh, Greek, if you went to Greece today, do you know what birthday presents, the word they use there? This exact word. And so my point is simply this is that God gifts us because he loves us and not necessarily because we deserve these gifts. And so you don't have to earn any of these things. If you're a believer and that you know Jesus as your savior, God gifts you because he loves you. And they come to us, here again, not as something that we have earned, but they are grace gifts from his hand. And so he, he, he gifts us in so many different ways. And you know what this does? It does away with any envy or jealousy. You know, sometimes uh, in my flesh, I guess, uh, I see Nero and I see Gabe playing the piano. And I would go, golly, I really wish I could play the piano. Have you ever been like that a little bit? You say, well, I'm just kind of, well, I'm going, wait a minute. You know, I may not be able to play the piano, but I know Gabe can't preach worth a hoot. And uh, no, just kidding. Um, yeah, <laughs> he probably could do really well. But uh, my point is, I'm not Gabe and Gabe's not me. And that's, that's okay, because that's how God has created us, and that we are excited about that. Well, then there are different ways to serve. The idea behind this is, and Paul was dealing with actually an attitude or a mindset. And um, there, there's something that if we're not very careful that actually can happen. Let me ask you a question. How many of you here are blessed by our worship team as well as our musicians from week to week at Calvary Temple? Don't you love it? They do a great job. But the point is, friends, that they are not doing that to showcase their, their giftings and abilities, but they're doing this to help us to serve better in order to, to lead us into worship. And, and Paul was cautioning the church that gifts are not given to be kind of like, this is the spiritual edition of American Idol. But the idea that God gives gifts to people so that we can serve others within the body and make a difference. Does that make sense? And so that, again, we don't have to be envious or jealous, but simply using our gifts so that we can serve others. And then we are energized by the Spirit. He said there are different kinds of workings. The word workings there is, is an interesting word in the Greek New Testament. It's actually where we get the word energy in English. And so what this is simply saying is that when we understand our gifts and abilities and begin to use them, that we are energized not by ourselves and our own abilities, but we are energized by the Spirit of God that lives within each one of us. And so his energy works in our lives as Christ followers so that it can spill out into the life of this community as well as the community of which we are a part. And so the good news is that we're simply not having to try harder or try to do better, but we have to simply allow the Holy Spirit to be released in our lives and that people will see the difference that Jesus makes. Isn't that good news today? And so no matter who you are, what you're doing, it's going to intensify and it's going to increase your ability to testify for Jesus because it's not just you anymore. It's the Spirit of God working through you that so desperately wants people that are far from God to know him. And so he's gonna cause you to be more effective in your relationships and that your testimony is going to be effective as well as, here again, transforming your relationships relationships, and it's because the Spirit of God is being released, and His energy is working in your life. Glory to God. And so it's no longer you simply trying harder, but allowing the Spirit of God to be released through
through you. Isn't that good news today that we don't here again have to try harder, but it's allowing the spirit to work? Well, then Paul offers one final challenge to us and that he wants all of us to be bodybuilders. Now, when I talk about bodybuilders, I'm not talking about the kind that have muscles on their muscles and that, in fact, I watched a show one time that, and, and this is not the way it's supposed to be. This, these guys were posing. And so the announcer said, okay, now what do you use those muscles for? And the guy just goes, he said, no, no, no. Now, how do you use those muscles? You know, and, and so obviously these guys were what? They were just posers. Well, that, that God wants us to not be gifted so we can just go around going, but that we can, is that impressive? But that, that uh, <laughs> I'm gonna flap my flab, but at any rate, <laughs> that God wants us to be energized so that we can be bodybuilders, so that we can be a part of what God is doing. And this is such good news today, friends, that God is building his church so as to bring people that are far from him to Christ and then for us together to be a beacon of hope in a dying culture, and that he accomplishes that by letting each one of us be a part of something that is so much bigger and is so much better than anything that we could accomplish on our own, and that the Spirit gifts every one of us to enhance what he wants to do through all of us. He gifts each one of us to enhance what he wants to do through all of us. And so I can just say it this way. It's really not about me. It's really not about you. But it's about the Spirit working through us collectively to be more efficient. And then Paul talks about how the body works and the significance of each part. And, you know, if you're thinking about the Raiders game, well, actually, they played on Thursday, didn't they? Um, or if you're thinking about lunch afterwards, would you rein it in for a minute to hear this? This is so vital that we all understand this as a part of this church body. That Paul then, verses 12 and following, he uses a very powerful illustration that we can all relate to. He said, the, church, the, the physical body, and the, he talks about the various parts in, in your body as well as mine, is intricate in, in its makeup, and it has tissues and organs and veins and arteries and all these kinds of things, a gazillion different parts, but they come together for what? One unified whole, to make me who I am, to make you who you are. But think about this. What happens when maybe one of those parts is not either in the body or it's not working? What happens to you? Now, I guess maybe you could do without your appendix. Like you could, can live without that. I don't know about you, but I want all of my parts there and I want them to be working. Because think about this. What happens if your liver's in your body but it stops working? You're gonna be in serious physical problem. Or what, is, what creates maybe death for a lot of Mary? Heart attacks. What's the issue? Their heart is in their body, but it stops working. And they're in serious, and so the analogy is this. It's not that every one of us, that we maybe know what our gifting is, but are we using it? Say, well, I'm gonna show up for an hour and 15 minutes on a Sunday morning. Wow, we're gonna be so far below our potential. So it's not just, are you here, but are you engaged? Are you using your giftings and abilities? Because you see, you understand, that as a church body, and what is that adage? That uh, the chain is only as strong as what? It's weakest link. So don't be the weak link. That we need every one of you to be a part of what we're doing, but to also be engaged and working because we're gonna be so much more effective when you know what your gifts are, and Growth Track will help you with that, but also that you're using them, you're engaging them for kingdom purposes. And that makes such a big difference. Well, I've given some general principles about spiritual gifts and the discovery process. And Jason Morgan now comes, and he's gonna give you some specifics about how you can develop your gifts. Let's welcome Jason. Thanks, Steve. Bye. So how does one go about developing your spiritual gifts and abilities? Well, it's simple, it's the three eyes. You can fill them in in your notes. The first eye is you need to investigate and identify your spiritual gifts. Let me tell you how easy it is, growth track. Growth Track is a cycle of four classes, one hour long, that goes through four weekends, that helps you identify your next best step in spiritual formation. So it doesn't matter whether you're kicking the tires and looking underneath the hood and investigating who is this Jesus, or whether you've had a lifelong relationship with Christ, Growth Track is for you to help you identify your next step in your spiritual journey. 
as a part of growth track, in step number three of growth track, we actually help you uh, identify who God's uniquely made you by taking five easy assessments. It helps identify your unique personality, your unique gifts and abilities, uh, your uh, passions, and also your spiritual gifts, and it helps you hone in on where you could best use those gifts. We have one cycle left for 2017. It's starting next weekend at the 1030 service in the 220s. You can sign up for that and you can go to the class and then attend your regular service here at the noon. Uh, after you've identified your unique giftings and abilities, the next step is to invest. Invest and then grow in those spiritual gifts. I like to say that um, spiritual gifts are a lot like a muscle. Right, If you want to grow a muscle, you go to the gym, you do the prescribed uh, lifts for that muscle, and you do it over a period of time, and what you're going to see is you're going to see growth and development, you're going to see strength, and you're going to see greater ability, right? I think of my freshman year of high school, I walked into the gym for the first time just before football, and all the coaches were there, and we had to test out how much weight we could lift in three lifts. And uh, I went to the squat racks, and I lifted 285 pounds one time. That was my maximum. And then you fast forward that through four years of high school practices, athletic uh, trainings and whatnot, into college football, and there it's a whole different level. You have six uh, workouts a week, you have a coach assigned to you that you're weighing in with, that they're watching your diet, that they're watching your makeup. You check in, my lifting time was six o'clock in the morning with some of the other offensive linemen. There was a coach sitting there saying, okay, he's here. If I wasn't there, he was knocking on my door at 6 a.m., Morgan, wake up, get out of bed, get down to the gym right now. And my junior year of college, I lifted the most weight I've ever lifted in my life. I lifted 585 pounds one time on the squat racks. And it was over a seven-year period that I grew 300 pounds worth of strength through regular working out, right? Well, then you guys finish the statement. If you don't use it, you lose it, right? So let's fast forward again. Out of college, when I have a family and a job and I'm going about I don't have a coach that's waking me up at 6 o'clock in the morning going, Morgan, where are you at? right? And what happens to muscle if you don't use it? It atrophies, it gets smaller, you don't have as great of ability, right? So I go into the gym, and I go to the squat racks, and I put 315 pounds on there, and I can only get it up a couple times. In college, we used to warm up with 315 pounds doing three sets of 10, and that wasn't even part of the workup. That was just to get the muscles going, right? And now I can't do that. So in your life, I bet you you can think back of a musical instrument or a hobby or some sort of activity or something that maybe you haven't done in a long time. And when you go to it now, you're like, I don't even know where to begin again, right? It's because when we don't use something, we lose it. And the same is true with your gifts and ability that God has given you. If you don't use that on a regular basis, it goes away, right? And so we need to make sure we do that. And one of the great things about Growth Track is we actually are going to give you opportunities in the community and in our church family to use your gifts and abilities so that you can grow and, and also help grow the kingdom. After we've identified and invested in that, it's always good for the last eye is to inspect your results. You know, a life um, unexamined uh, is not worth living, right? And so any time that we invest ourselves greatly with time, energy, resources, it's always really good to take a step back and check your pulse, right? Say, hey, how am I doing in this? Is this the best me? Is this using my time and energy wisely, right? And so when we start using our gifts and abilities, it's really good to ask ourselves some basic questions. Hey, Am I encouraging other people? Do other people see this as my sweet spot? Am I feeling encouraged? Am I feeling fulfilled? Just like Pastor talked to us just a moment ago about the rabbit, the duck, and the eagle, right? If we're a duck, let's stay to the swimming pool and, and swim. There are things in your life that you're going to get A's in, and there's things that, if you're like me, I get D's and F's sometimes in other categories. Let's focus on our A's when it comes to spiritual giftings and abilities. I leave you with this. It's the fourth eye. You're not going to find it in your notes or on the screens. It's initiate. You know, we're really good as human beings about putting something off until next week. I'm sure that each of you can probably think back in your life and go, you know, I I'm going to start that diet next week. I I'm going to go to the gym and start working out next week, maybe when they're running one of those better specials. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go look for that better job that I keep talking about and, and doing that. You know, I'm going to be the parent that I plan to be um, maybe next week. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that household project or that, that thing that's in my garage that I haven't touched in 10 years that I've, I've been telling myself next week I'm going to start, right? We can put stuff off really well. Well, when it comes to our spiritual formation, guys, do not put it off another week or another year. Start now. And so there, there's one opportunity left in 2017. This is the last weekend to sign up for Growth Track in the year 2017. There are two ways you can do it. 
you can walk out of the lobby right uh, after service and there's a growth track counter that has this big picture right behind it. You can sign up for next week's cycle. Or in the seat back in front of you, you can pull out this card right here. It has on it a web address that if you type it in your mobile device or your home computer, uh, you can sign up for that cycle for next week. All right, we'll be picking up courses again uh, starting in December and going into the courses will start in January, but I am telling you, do not put off for another week growth track. Pastor Steve. Thanks, well, I, uh, I hope that this has been an exciting time for you in understanding how God has gifted you and his desires for you. And I want to wrap up with this. There was a man by the name of Samuel Chadwick who maybe were, it was where some of you are and wondering about if God had gifted him. And something happened one day where he began to realize that the Spirit of God lived in him and was gifting him, and this was his testimony. I, and uh, I love his words. He said this, Every part of my being was awakened. I did not get a new brain, but I got a new mentality. I did not get a new ability to speak, but I got a new effectiveness to speak. Immediately, I was empowered and realized it was the work of the Spirit. And with the same basic natural abilities, but they were energized, quickened, and reinforced into a bigger vitality and effectiveness that no one would ever have dreamed possible in my life. And that's my dream and my desire for each one of you, is that you would discover and begin to use your giftings and that you would be enabled by the Spirit for a new effectiveness. And um, I want you to know that your name is on a gift in God's heaven under his tree. And that I want to encourage every one of you to open the gift and that I guarantee you, you will not be disappointed and that will bring you great joy and also help you to be very effective, not only in your own life, but helping us as a church to have kingdom impact. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together.